achieved. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome into Studio Day here for a day quarantine for another lovely day. Uh, today, we got a little mailbag action. Things that you guys have asked that I'll talk but, but, but. I only do one take. I can stumble over as many words as I want. I don't do two takes. Welcome into Studio Day Heffrey. Let's talk Dallas Cowboys football, shall we? So, uh, a few topics worth discussing today. Which one did I put first? Cowboys red zone. Okay, so, I thought this was a good question. That was asked by Big Dog 9196 And remember, every day, if you just go to the YouTube page, youtube.com slash Jeff Cavanaugh, and leave in the comments of a video what you want to talk about tomorrow, I try my best to get to it. So, Big Dog, with a good question, because yesterday I was, I was singing the praises of top 10 quarterback in the NFL, Dak Prescott, and this is the question. He said, you're right about Dak possibly being a top 10 quarterback, but explain then why he's unable to score in the red zone. If he's as great as you make him out to be, why the terrible TD rate in the red zone? And so I looked it up because that's what we should do, right? I'm going free mic today. So I looked it up. Let's compare Dak to some of the other quarterbacks in the NFL. The guy who scored the most in the red zone throwing the ball is Russell Wilson. He threw 25 touchdowns in the red zone. That's pretty darn good. Um, Lamar Jackson threw 24 touchdowns in the red zone. Matt Ryan threw 20. Carson Wentz threw 19. Jameis, 19. Breeze, 18. Goff, 18. Watson, 18. Cousins, Fitzpatrick, Garoppolo, Minshew, Dak, Rogers, 16. So that number's okay. Uh, would you like it to be higher? Yeah, that number's okay. But the number that kind of jumps out to me when I'm looking at this is I focus on... What's your completion percentage in the red zone? Because it gets hard in there, right? It gets tough. Drew Brees still completes almost 70% of his passes. Lamar, 63. Now, Lamar gets a little different looks than most because he's such a monster running the ball. But a lot of guys start dropping into the 50s, and Dak is one of them. 52% completion in the red zone, 47% completion inside the 10-yard line. And the guys who get their shine on with the completion percentage in those spots – is actually Lamar Jackson, Jared Goff, Jimmy Garoppolo, Aaron Rodgers, Drew Brees. Those are the guys who's – and Russ inside the 10 is still good, but inside the 20 is below 50%. So Dak had 16 touchdowns and no picks in the red zone. Those numbers are good, but the number of touchdowns probably goes up if you're able to complete more passes. So I will acknowledge this one. I think this is worth tracking going forward this year is – What does the Cowboys offense look like in the red zone? And when they're throwing the ball, are they able to complete well over half of the passes? Because I think you should be able to do that because the field's shrinking. This is where it gets hard to play quarterback. It gets hard to play quarterback when now you not only have both sidelines that are out of bounds, but now you got a back line. So there's only so far that you can go down the field. And I do think that's important to track. And I think the important question to ask is, is how much will coaching matter in this regard? Because I'm not going to make the case right now that Dak is a great red zone player. Now, factors that could help improve that, I think number one, the number of times that I watched them inside the 10-yard line when they ran a pass play, run a play called all curls, was maddening. How is that planning to get open? You spread them out and you run all curls. Are you hoping they're going to have two deep safeties and not enough guys to cover the front of the end zone? It's just a that play call is bonkers to me. You got to get people moving across the field. You got to get people crossing up to see what kind of coverage you have to try to bust somebody open for an easy touchdown. And I also think that Amari Cooper is a great player. Michael Gallup's a good player, hopefully becoming a great player. I don't think either of those guys are especially lethal red zone weapons, and I think CeeDee Lamb has the potential to be that. I think CeeDee Lamb may help you in the red zone because that's the guy that can go take the football from people in contested catches. Gallup's made some great catches, but just in terms of the natural hands when the ball is way away from your body or you've got to make a big-time adjustment, I think that's where CeeDee Lamb gets his shine on. Um, So, yeah, I think that's worth tracking. 52% completion percentage inside the 20 I don't think that's good enough. 
47% completion inside the 10. I don't think that's good enough. So I'd like to see Dak get on par with the with the great quarterbacks. Or, so part of this is great quarterbacks, and part of this is great scheme. Because even Jared Goff, who I, you know, I don't think had a great year last year, 18 touchdowns, no picks in the red zone. From inside the 10, 15 touchdowns, no picks. Completed 62% of his passes inside the 10, 65% inside the 20. He was balling in the red zone. He was getting it done. So, yeah, through a combination of things, that is a great opportunity for growth for Dak. It doesn't change that he's obviously a top-10 quarterback in the league, but, yeah, that is an opportunity for growth. Inside your division, look at Carson Wentz. Completes almost 60% of his passes in the red zone, 19 touchdowns, no picks from inside the 10. He still keeps it at 57%, 15 touchdowns, no picks, compared to Dak's 47, seven touchdowns and no picks inside the 10. So, inside the 10, they did not do a great job of uh, throwing the ball to score. And I don't have pulled up, like, how often did you put your quarterback in a bad spot because you insisted on running the ball all the time. I don't have those things in front of me. But opportunity for growth, red zone, Dak, Absolutely. Absolutely. To the people who, you know, get angry in the comments. Talking about Dak, boy, your comments will go bonkers. Um, No, his agent doesn't pay me, if you're wondering, because I've been accused of that. Do you remember two years ago when I had severe doubts that he was the guy at all? And do you remember when I was totally sure that Goff and Wentz were better players than him? Because those things happened. I didn't arrive at the conclusion of Dak is really good because I was convinced of it all along. He convinced me. Being open to the idea that you could be wrong about a guy initially who I graded in the fourth round, you're supposed to be open to that when you get new evidence. Okay? All right. Next thing we want to talk about, what I put in the headline there, Larry Warford. So Larry Warford is a free agent, offensive lineman, Guard, I believe he played right guard, but um, he's a free agent now. He's looking for a salary of around eight million dollars, and or seven million dollars apparently is what they're saying. The Saints released him last week, and they because they're going to let their draft pick and last year's draft pick man the center spot and one of the guard spots. So they let go of Larry Warford to save money. He's looking for $7 million. Do the Cowboys have $7 million? I believe they do. Would Larry Warford make their team better? I believe he would. But at some point, do you want to have competition and guys who don't make a bunch of money on your team? I think the Cowboys' likely scenario is they're going to look at the interior of that offensive line and they're going to say, okay, Connor Williams was a second-round pick. Connor McGovern was a third-round pick. Joe Looney we brought back. Tyler Biotish, the Wisconsin center, we just traded up in a draft to put him on the roster, and I think they're going to just let those guys compete. Would Larry Warford make the team better? Probably. Now, I believe he's played right guard, so I don't – I don't know if you could just plug and say, well, you're a left guard now. But, I mean, I'd be interested. I think if you have cap space this year and you can get guys on a one-year deal, what's the downside? Especially on the Cowboys' offensive line. What if Larry Warford is signed on a one-year deal? He plays well. The offensive line plays well. They protect Dak well. They block in the run game well. Then at the end of the year, you know what happens to guys like Larry Warford if they play pretty well? They get the effect of the Cowboys' offensive line, and you go to a Pro Bowl. Then you don't bring him back. You get a comp pick. That's the comp pick game. Uh, yeah, I'm interested in Larry Warford, but I think the most likely thing that's going to happen is they're going to say, no, nah, we got a bunch of guys. We like the competition that we have in there, and we'll see who wins the starting jobs, and we'll see who's the left guard and who's the center. So I doubt that Larry Warford is going to be a Dallas Cowboy, but if they did it, would I like it? Yes. Josh Williams says, where the hell did he get that hat? If you're talking about any of the bucket hats that I rock, I believe they're from the Cowboys Pro Shop. Some of them might be draft. This one's kind of small, squeezes my head. It might be a lady's hat. I don't know. But I have a hookup. I got a Cowboys hookup. I pay full market price, of course, but I know people. Uh, Jeff, in your honest opinion, this is from Matt Leggett. Do you believe Cowboys and Dak 
will get the deal done by the deadline of July 15th, because I pray they do, but who the hell knows with Jerry Jones, man. I lean towards, yes, they're going to get the deal done, but I don't feel great about it at all. I mean, the longer this thing is played out, it's now over multiple years that this thing has played out where they've talked about trying to get a deal done. Jerry, Remember Jerry referred to it as imminent, that the deal was going to get done, and that was before last season, and it never got done. So... Yes, deadlines make deals. Yes, it's totally possible, and I'll say better than 50% that they get their deal done with Dak before July 15th. But if they don't, it's not that big a deal. Now, it puts you on the doorstep to Dak having your nuts in a vice because now you get to another year and he's looking at it. Like, think about this. Think about the COVID thing, right? COVID-19 is going to affect us. There's a chance the salary cap goes down next year. We were getting ready for it to absolutely explode and go up $20, $30 million a pop every year. There's a decent chance it goes down next year because they're going to lose revenue with no fans in the stadium probably. Maybe do they play 16, whatever, whatever happens, right? There's a chance the cap goes down. If Dak plays under the tag this year, his number doesn't go down because his number with that tag goes up by a percentage of his previous year's salary. So Dak's still going to be a $40 million man next year which becomes the starting point for a negotiation. Now his agent says the starting point is over $40 million a year and three years of it guaranteed. So guarantees of 120, 130 million. That's how the negotiations work is they look at what would happen if you had to tag me three times. And once you've already done it once, the answer is 40 million, 50 something million, 80 million. So now the agent's like, well, (laughs) look what you guys did. Whoops. And that's how the Kirk Cousins thing happens. And uh, Jeff Noble, he asked me, he said, did, uh, he said, if the Cowboys were sending the tag, who gives Dak $28 million? My answer, Dak breaks the record for biggest contract in the history of the league and most guaranteed money in the history of the league if he hits free agency. Jimmy Garoppolo, at one point, was the highest paid player in football because he played quarterback, and he was a team's guy, and it was his turn. Kirk Cousins, when they couldn't tag him anymore in Washington – got every single dollar in his contract guaranteed by the Vikings because he played quarterback, pretty good at it, and he was up. When Dak's up, whether it's Jacksonville, whether it's the Raiders or the Patriots, uh, right this second, maybe it would be tougher for him to get that deal because of where teams are with the cap and with team building. But you let a really good quarterback hit unrestricted free agency, and he breaks the record for biggest contract of all time. That's the way it goes. That's that's guaranteed. Guaranteed. So just think of anybody that needs a quarterback, and they would make him very, very, very rich. Let's see. We did the hat. We did the red zone. We did the, will Dak get the deal done? My vote is yes, but I don't feel great about it. I don't think the Cowboys are scared of having him play on the tag. I don't. I think the Cowboys are not afraid of that at all, which is weird. It's a weird move to me, and it's a weird move to just keep waiting till certain deadlines when you'd really like to have them involved in your offseason program. But pfft, Cowboys don't care. Mark, Mark Felix, he said, what kind of impact do you think there will be if there are no fans in any of the stadiums? I think it levels the playing field for every game, basically. I mean, you still, sure, there's travel, so are you a half percent worse than the home team? Maybe. But I think going to Seattle – that's massive if they don't have their fans in the stands. For the Cowboy games, maybe not that big of a deal. And for a lot of road games, not that big of a deal. The Rams fan base isn't wild. You know, there's there's teams in the league. The Chargers have no fans. There's teams in the league where it doesn't matter because the Cowboys are really the home team in a lot of road games. But a team like Seattle or if you play a team like Kansas City on the road, the teams where they got those fan bases that go bonkers, yeah, the team feeds off that. And, yeah, it'll be a big deal. It doesn't hurt the Cowboys to not have fans in the stadium because their home field advantage is, eh, you know, they play in a palace. Not a lot of normal people can get in that bad boy. Michael McClain, Jeff, what's the only way you'd be comfortable with the Cowboys losing Dak? Trevor Lawrence or Justin Fields? The answer ain't Andy Dalton or Marcus Mariota. Jameis was interesting to me, but um, you got $1 million. Jameis was interesting to me. But I think for me, the answer is have a top five pick. 
so you can get a guy in a rookie deal that you really think is going to become a really good starter in the league, that's the only way I would be comfortable with it. And that's the biggest thing about Dak. The biggest thing about Dak isn't that I'm making the case that he's the best quarterback in the league. I'm not making the case that Dak can do it by himself if his surroundings aren't good. I think we've seen those opportunities, and a lot of times they come up short, and he comes up short. So, you know, I'm not making the case that he can overcome that and that he is going to drag your team to victories no matter what. Just that he's one of the better quarterbacks in the league right now. Um, Tom Brady, his surroundings were bad last year. I think he's washed. Maybe he's about to be good in Tampa Bay because his surroundings are better. Like, there aren't – Patrick Mahomes' surroundings are awesome. Andy Reid, Tyreek Hill, Travis Kelsey, Nicole Hardman, Sammy Watkins. Like, is Patrick Mahomes considered future GOAT if he had been drafted by fill-in-the-blank? If Patrick Mahomes was a bangle, do you think we'd be ready to crown him future GOAT? Or do you think his situation helped with that? So, yeah, Dak gets help from his surroundings, as does everybody else that you consider a great quarterback right now. Uh, yeah, give me the number one overall pick next year, and then you tell me that they're letting Dak go. Yeah, I'll dance with Trevor Lawrence on a rookie deal. I'm a believer in that. Justin Fields, too. Give me a top two pick next year, and I'm comfortable letting Dak go. Other than that, nobody gets worse at quarterback on purpose. It's a weird plan. Um, okay, that's what I got for you today. So leave in the comments on youtube.com slash Jeff Cavanaugh, which we're going to talk about tomorrow, and I will take care of you. And check 1053thefan.com every day. I love you guys, and I'll see you on the radio.